sitting here at lovely 15 Perry Street, and you're listening to Mentors, Mentors for Military, and I'm with my sidekick, Jason Belford. What up? We've got a uh, secondary co-host. Uh, Dave Elder was on the podcast, and you're going to probably listen to his episode before this one. And if you do, uh, Dave, welcome as a co-host. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be back. Yeah, I'm glad to, that you're here as a co-host. He, Dave was actually going to leave the the room, and then it, Marshall walked in the door, and then we just we twisted his arm. Yeah, it was hard. It didn't take much. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. So Marshall, uh, welcome to Mentors for Military. I don't know if you've listened to our podcast before and everything, but I'm glad that you're here. Yeah, this really started a relationship, working relationship with uh, Jason, and I really appreciate it. I'm humbled that he'd have me on. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, awesome. So let's go. we're going to go back, and if you've listened to the episode, one of the reasons why I said that is I like to go back to some of the humble beginnings and, and where you started off. I think um, there's always that fascinating story of where people kind of grew up and mm-hmm. why they ended up joining the military that people leave out on occasion in conversation, but I always find it fascinating. So for you, where was home? Originally, I'm from uh, Warsaw, Indiana, northern Indiana, but, uh, you know, as we start to talk more about my story, you'll hear that North Carolina played a big role, uh, because I went to boarding school in North Carolina, and I played college basketball in Duke in uh, Durham, North Carolina, so I spent about eight or nine years in North Carolina. If I get a break, that's normally where I go try to spend it. It has... uh, Homey vibes. Yeah. So if you're, you hear the deep voice, if you're listening via audio and if you're watching video, then you're going to notice that you're a tall guy. (laughs) A little bit. Yeah. So when you walked in the room, I was a little shocked. Um, I I wasn't expecting, I don't know why I wasn't expecting (laughs) it, but anyway, um, we're going to get into all that. You just Mm. said about Duke and the whole bit. Um, so any military family? Uh, you know, I have a couple, you know, my grandfather served in the Navy in World War II, um, but no, uh, no immediate family member served in the military. Uh, this, uh, this really started when I was a high school basketball player, and I played on a USA basketball team that played in Germany. And uh, because we were playing in Germany, there weren't a lot of U.S. Uh, fans there for us, but there were soldiers who were there at that Army base cheering oh, for yeah. us. And I think I kind of caught the bug there. Uh, yeah. And so when you're playing, you've got USA on your chest. You've got, you know, soldiers cheering for you. It was a pretty cool vibe. And I thought, hey, you know, I like this. I liked history growing up. And so after the game, I saw one of the the first soldiers I could find. It was a tall guy. He was about 6'7", 6'8", tall soldier. I'm seven feet. Yeah. Uh, And I went up to him and I I tapped him. I said, hey, buddy, you know, could you tell me a little bit about, you know, work for you? Could it work for me? And shame on me. Uh, I found out as a two-star general at the time. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, buddy. (laughs) Uh, That's awesome. Generals in the army. (laughs) I (laughs) see generals. I'm like, that that guy was bred to do that. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, he uh, turns out this was uh, General Robert Brown. And uh, the small world moment, he had played college ball for uh, Mike Shashevsky. Oh, of course. Point. Yeah. Yeah. And he pulled me aside at a young age. And even though I, I didn't, we talked about the military in my family, even though there wasn't a lot of military in my immediate family, he became a mentor to me. And he said, hey, I know you're passionate about basketball. I know you're passionate about the military. I think we can find a way for you to do both if you want it bad enough. Uh, so that, that's really, uh, I know you're asking about where the military came from. I'd have to chalk a lot of that up to General Robert Brown. Yeah, that's crazy. First off, you had, of course, being a civilian, you had no idea. The beauty of this whole thing, though, is his openness to that conversation, the mm-hmm. way he approached it. I mean, he could have just said, do you know who you're talking to here? <laughs> you know, called over. It's funny, one of his age or something didn't walk over and go, hey, buddy, hey, 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 what are you getting a little too close to this guy? Because, I mean, there is a little bit of an ego stuff there. So that's why I say that. Yeah, um, in- incredibly approachable. And yeah. uh, you hit the nail on the head as a civilian, not knowing any better. I, did, I didn't know any better. If I could go back, I, I would you know, slap myself upside the head. That's, yeah, no, it's, but, it's beautiful. I'm sure he probably appreciated it, you know, and just being a you know, gave him a chance to be a regular guy. Yeah, I, he took me uh, after the game to the local MWR bowling alley. He got me a chili cheese hot dog, and he gave me a signed copy of We Were Once Soldiers. Uh, wow, and, wow. And, uh, you know, he he told me more specifically, I was I was undecided in my, uh, where I was going to play college basketball at that point. Yeah. And my brothers were playing basketball at Duke, uh, but I wasn't going to let that sway me. I wanted to do what was best for me. And he said, hey, Marshall, we, we've talked a lot about this uh theme of being a part of something bigger than yourself. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, I feel like there are two places you can do that. You can either go to West Point 
uh, and, and be a part of the organization. Right? I think the closest thing you get would be to go play for Coach K at Duke. Uh, so it's funny. People just assume they attribute the fact, oh, my brothers went to Duke. Of course Marshall was going to go play at Duke like his brothers Miles and Mason. Uh, again, I, I think uh, General Robert Brown had a big, uh, a big piece of that. Yeah, wow, it's so interesting. So, um, you, when you met him first off, you were in tenth grade or so. Uh, oh man, because you said two years. That's junior, junior, I was junior okay. high school. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you were just really kind of playing the land. I think I love what I like about this is that he was willing to be a mentor to you and and you know really try to give you some straightforward advice as to what you. Well, he probably listened a little bit to what you wanted to do as well. But I mean, uh, <clears throat> giving you some really straightforward advice in this whole thing. Yeah. Um, that, that's really helpful. So you go off to Duke mm -hmm. and, um, scholarship, full scholarship, right? Yep. Full scholarship to Duke. I actually, I, I came in, I was a McDonald's all American, which I was proud of this normally, you know, the collection of the top 10 or, or 20 so basketball yep. players in the country. And normally when you're coming as a McDonald's all American, I'd say traditionally there's an expectation for, Hey, you're going to make a huge immediate impact on this program. But uh, Duke basketball attracts a lot of McDonald's All-Americans. You might, you know, it might yeah. not be as special as you think you are. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's funny on paper, I, I had all these good reasons to go to Duke. And I was excited, and then I show up there day one, and I love my brothers, but it kind of hit dawned on me. Oh no, you know, they've got two bigger, stronger versions of me on the team already. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually I ended up redshirting my first year, which was a smart move. I'm really glad that I did. I sat out the year. Uh, but it, it's pretty rare for normally a, a top recruited high school player who was a McDonald's All-American to come in and redshirt. But yeah. it, it's something I needed to do. I'm glad that I did it. And so my Duke career got off to a really slow start before I, I started to perform better towards the tail end. I've got two questions for you. Mm -hmm. One is around um, scholarships. Now, I know football, you end up getting like a real full ride. Does basketball equate to the same or is it a, you more, more like a partial? Oh, um, uh, yeah. No, that's a fair question. Yeah, uh, No, completely uh, full ride. Okay. Yeah. And then the second question would be about how do you, how is your feelings around the NIL, uh, that whole thing now that's going on in college sports? It's, it's, uh, wild. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities that I didn't even think of cropping up. You know, I, I was just talking the other day with a, a pair of brothers, former Georgia football players that started, uh, creating NFTs mm. and they sold these, uh, online, uh, caricatures, that, uh, but they're, the way I interpret it is they're almost like the way you collect baseball cards, but they're digital versions. Anyways, uh, they made these baseball cards. They made 4,500 of them. I think they sold them for $200 a piece, and they sold out in four hours. And they gave half the profits to the team. And I thought, man, that was the coolest thing. And this wasn't a meager check. You know, I, you can do, do the numbers yourself. But the, each of the players, they were very well compensated for their name, image, likeness. And uh, just opportunities I wouldn't have even thought of. For me, when I was coming up, there was one chance to kind of, you know, capitalize on uh, being a Duke basketball player in the area. It was called barnstorming. And that's after your senior year, when the rules don't apply to you anymore, uh, someone gets all the, the famous players from Duke and UNC and NC State and Wake Forest, gets them all together, and they go on kind of a, a tour of playing at different high schools. And they'll sell signed shoes, they'll sell jerseys, you know, you might have a chance to make uh, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, which really helps in that transition to being a pro basketball player. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, it's funny the, how far we've come from barnstorming to now people are selling these, they're almost like online digital Pokemon cards to, <laughs> <laughs> to turn yeah, insane it's profits. Insane. It's, it's just uh, opened wide up. Oh, it's totally changed the game in terms of like a free trade. The portal is now becoming, you know, that's another thing that wasn't around. Now the portal is out there and people can put themselves in the, you know, they can go win a ring at the University of Alabama as a freshman or sophomore. And then they go, okay, let me see what my, my worth is out there. And they put themselves in the portal just to kind of, you know, dip their toes in and see who wants to pay the highest price. And it, it's just, to me, it's, um, I don't, I haven't figured out yet if it's going to ruin the sport. You know, overall, um, I fear, fear like in college football, it's going to become the CFL. Um, you know, you have the NFL and then you have the minors, you know, and the CFL becomes the minors type of thing. And I just don't know if that's going to be good for the sport. So it's it's always interesting to hear it from somebody who played the game and 
you know, what your thoughts are, you know, especially yeah. you were in the era when they didn't have it. So how do you feel about those that are getting it? Yeah. Uh, I'd be lying if I said there, there's just a, a one overwhelmingly excited and happy form, but there's yeah. always that twinge of, Oh man, I wish I had that. Oh thing. yeah, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> a lot of money to miss out on. Yeah. But I, uh, you know, I, I can't knock my experience and my experience is paying dividends in a lot of indirect ways between, you know, you, you go to an institution, a school and you really pour your soul into it in a lot of ways that don't show up on paper, uh, the people in that school associated with that school, they, they'll care about you too, uh, moving yeah. forward. So now with each leg of my journey, uh, you know, I have people from Duke University that are invested in Marshall Plumley and they want to see me do well. And it, it's hard to put a price tag on that support system. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't want to see, uh, I'm excited for the opportunities that are cropping up, but I, I'm the same as you. I have reservations and I, I don't want to see the, uh, the spirit of the sport go yeah. away. That's the big thing. College yeah. is there for what's beautiful about college sports is the way, especially here in the South, um, you know, you can see it a lot and, um, where there's a lot of fans. I mean, that's what they are. They're fanatics. They, mm -hmm. they, you know, from the time that you're born, depending upon which state, like, you know, in Dave's case, in the state of Alabama, you have to pick one of the two universities and <laughs> you better time. hope you pick the right one, whatever <laughs> that right one is supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so it's, it's a major thing, right? We really enjoy, mm -hmm. um, you know, the band being there and, you know, you really don't want piped in music. You want to hear the college band. You want to feel that whole presence that you don't see and feel when you go to a, you know, a, um, a professional sport. And uh, that's my concern is that it's going to get uh, diluted a little bit or it's going to change. And maybe I'm just being old school. And I totally took us off a uh, different rabbit hole here. But mm -hmm. I wanted to get your thoughts on that while we had the moment. Yeah. Um, so did you end up going ROTC or anything while you were in college? Or was that one of the things that he recommended? Yeah. So uh, part of this uh, was going a little bit into uncharted territory and that, you know, I was dead set. My dream was to play basketball in the NBA. Uh, but also I wanted to serve. And, and people thought th these are two mutually exclusive things. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, General Brown, you know, we kept this relationship going through Duke and he ended up, I think at one point he was uh, uh, three star at, at Benning. And uh, during one of my off seasons, I got in the family minivan and I drove from Durham, North Carolina to Fort Benning. Family <laughs> minivan. Yeah. yeah. The best part is, uh, Marshall, didn't you tell him what, what kind of uh, car you drive? Oh, right now I'm driving a Mini Cooper, uh, but... No uh, way! <laughs> <laughs> Did you take out the front seats? <laughs> no, no. But the, the, the reason behind the family minivan is we did take out the middle seats at a young age so that me and my two brothers would get stretch our legs in the back. Yeah. And <laughs> sister would ride on the floor. <laughs> it's just crazy to think. I don't know how you... Is it out here? Uh, the Mini Cooper? It, it's it's out and about. It's out there somewhere. I, uh, I Oh, no, I, I mean, is it outside? Would you drive up here? Oh, yeah, drive here? I, I drove the Mini Cooper. Oh, uh, yeah. We're going to have to get a photo of that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're definitely getting a photo of so, that. So the whole story of how many people can you fit in a Volkswagen, I'm wanting to see <laughs> yeah. if, how Marshall Plumley by himself fits in a Mini Cooper. Oh, yeah. No, it, it works. It, uh, I, I think Mini Cooper's, like, uh, performance fit, everything. I, I was at the dealership. He's like, if I could say one thing about them, they're going to exceed your expectations a little bit yeah i got inside of it i'm like uh, you know i fit in this better than the jeep dealership next door i was going to get a jeep yeah i'm like i'll, I'll take the mini <laughs> <laughs> awesome. so anyway you drove your minivan down to uh, fort benning and yes yeah what happened then yeah so we, uh oh gosh i think uh i think if i remember it correctly uh, general brown helped me i put on a basketball camp for some of the military families here at benning <clears throat> he uh he got me my first pair of military boots. I, I won't forget that. And that is a tall order because to find a size 17 military boot, uh, yeah. I think we were talking a little before the podcast. Right. It's not easy. Yeah. Uh, he had to go back, you know, back in the warehouse for that. <laughs> um, no, he probably had those specially made. <laughs> yeah. That's not a lie. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the boots, the basketball camp, and then he took me to play paintball with uh, Rangers. Uh, I remember it was kind of like a leadership development opportunity. It was something he was doing regardless, but he had me along. And I didn't know you guys go out and do uh, paintballing. I didn't either. Oh, okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and, uh, Evidently. <laughs> it, um, it, 
it blew my mind because I show up and all the guys, they have ghillie suits on and they're taking it serious and they've got face camo on and I'm in my uh, Duke blue uh, jumpsuit, uh, like my sweatsuit that I wear traveling with basketball. That powder baby blue. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and I'm seven feet tall already. I already stand out enough, uh, but I just, I got lit up. Well, I don't the general <laughs> did order it. The general was like, hey, I want to do this for this and I'm, you know, we make it happen. Yeah. yeah. If they're going to get asked to do something, they're going to do it all out like that. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Yeah. So I had a lot of fun there. But uh, I guess my takeaway from it, and and the more I've gotten to know someone like General Brown and others like him in the military, is is really he he stands to gain nothing from this. He just, uh, he's planting a bunch of trees that he'll never see grow is an analogy I I heard. And I I really think uh, lends itself to him. Yeah. Uh, And it's been so cool to know that it's not just me. I can tell you it's hard for me to go out and uh, meet with any leaders in today's army with, without not uh, any of the impactful good leaders who don't know who he is or that he's impacted them in some way. Wow. Uh, you know, my brigade commander uh, at my first unit was one of his platoon leaders. Um, I'm running into the uh, a couple of the battalion commanders. Yeah. Uh, I think it was uh, Colonel Shaw of uh, RSTB. Yeah. yeah, and worked together with General Brown. And it's cool. It's just in his blood that, you know, he selflessly gives and he mentors. And, uh, again, I, I'm probably, uh, uh, if anything, a problem child because, hey, we can't find boots that fit this guy. He's trying to play in the NBA. You know, this is more trouble than it's worth. But, no, he, he just cares about mentoring and making the people around him better. And he's done that with me and he's done that with others. And, and man, I'm lucky that I crossed paths with someone like that. Yeah, so while you were down there, I mean, is this the point at which he talked to you about ROTC or just about your when you get out uh, uh, with after graduation? Yeah, yeah, so we started to explore opportunities, and we ended up finding that, hey, if I'm going to pursue uh, professional basketball, maybe National Guard might be the best route. If mm. I can find a guard unit in whatever state I hope to play in. Yeah. And that's how it ended up working out. Now, I, I will say it, at first um, it, there was a little bit of friction. Because I mentioned I redshirted my first year of basketball. I sat out, didn't play at all. The day before our first game the next year, the, the, the practice before, I broke my foot. And then I was out pretty much another year. Yeah. And then, uh, and then coming into that you know, third year, I, I come to Coach K. And I say, hey, I found this thing with, with General Brown. I want to go into ROTC. And it's, whoa, Marshall, slow down. Uh, mm-hmm. Just slow down. Mm-hmm. And, and, You've got and, four years of eligibility, and he hasn't had none. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I haven't exactly yeah. delivered as a basketball player. <laughs> uh, and, and, and he was right, and he just wanted me to be measured and make sure I was doing it for the right reasons. And, uh, you know, Coach K used an analogy a lot about crossing bridges. And sometimes, you yeah. know, in your life, you got to cross, cross these tough bridges, even when you, you might not want to. And he was worried I had a bridge to cross as a basketball player, and I was avoiding it. And I was maybe uh, going to something else I thought I might be better at, uh, and that, which is a very fair point. So I'll say my, my ROTC opportunity at Duke is something I had to earn. I had to earn the faith of my coaches. I had to earn the, you know, the respect of my teammates as a player. And uh, eventually, it naturally came to a point where uh, Coach K saw not only could I do ROTC with basketball, but hey, the more Marshall does with ROTC, it's actually making him a better basketball player. Mm. It's making him a better leader on the floor. I had to leave for one month of uh, training at Fort Knox, Kentucky with ROTC, and I came back and I I became a, a team captain. And they really liked the impact that had on me. And I think even some of the coaches would joke, hey, can we sign some of the other players up for ROTC? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I can totally see that because of the teamwork and everything else where it crosses over. But yet I would think because of the requirements of ROTC, it's almost like um, it's like a sport. You're actually doing something outside of your core curriculum. Yeah. And so how did you balance both? Yeah, it was a uh, it was a scheduling nightmare. But yeah. when you have people on both sides of the coin that really want to see you succeed and do well, and they appreciate the the value of it uh, yeah. long term, uh, that that's the only thing that made it work. And more specifically, I'd say I, I have someone like a General Brown that appreciates uh, what I want to do. I have someone like Coach K that appreciates. I don't think there is a a, a coach or a figure in the basketball world that has an appreciation for the military, uh, you know, being a former West Point guy himself, uh, like Coach K, uh, mm-hmm. very unique and almost serendipitous how he ended up being my head coach. 
So he had an appreciation. And then the uh, professor of military science, the head of Duke Army ROTC, he appreciated it. And then at a different point, a new one came in. She appreciated what I was trying to do. Uh, so, yeah, there were scheduling conflicts, but there were times where they'd say, hey, you know, you've got a game tonight. You're going to be, you know, running up and down the floor against Syracuse and Cameron Indoor Stadium. We don't think we need you to come in at PT this morning at <laughs> 5 in the morning. I think that'll count as your PT. <laughs> yeah. for the That's awfully nice of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there were, that, that's an anecdote I use, but there were plenty of concessions where, hey, we, we think you're, you're in good basketball shape here. We can swap that here. And they were mixing and matching my schedule where uh, sometimes I'd have to do, you know, a couple independent studies in a row, one-on-one with a professor of military science just helping me. Uh, and they went to a lot of lengths, and I, I really amazing. appreciate it. And now as I'm, you know, performing in the military now, you feel that obligation, you want to pay it forward. They invested in me, and yeah. I want to uh, perform. Yeah, um, so if you'd, ran into, very well. yeah, if you'd have ran into Jason, though, as the ROTC instructor, I could totally see that. I don't give a damn about you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the younger Jason, that definitely probably would have yeah, been. Yeah, I, I could yeah, totally have seen yeah. that, uh, for sure. Uh, so you were trying to balance both of those. Did you end up spending all four years at Duke and using all of your eligibility, or did um, how did that work out? Because Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I did uh, spend all four years, in fact, five with the red shirt year and uh, going into my senior year, I actually had to, to start a, a graduate program to stay eligible for the NCAA. Yep, makes sense. Yep. Okay. How did that fit in with the ROTC with your contract? Cause did they have to delay anything, I, you know? Yeah. So uh, I, I will say my, when I was coming through, my understanding of the ROTC was after you contract, you know, going into you, what they call it like your junior and senior year, your yeah. MS three and MS four year after you contract, uh, it gets much more rigid. You know, you're you're in the military officially. The first two years, some people do it and they say, hey, it's not for them. Anyways, for me, I had kind of a, a condensed first two years. I did lots of independent studies. I would have to, uh, I'd have to meet with the professors all the time to get caught up on things I might have missed. Uh, mm-hmm. Because again, I redshirted that first year, I broke my foot the next. I wasn't in a lot of shape to be a good ROTC cadet. So I was in school for five years. Uh, I did ROTC for, I'd, I'd call it like three and a half years. And, uh, and some of those ROTC credits that I still needed to get, I needed to finish up. They went over into that super senior year, into that fifth year. Yeah. Finished that. Uh, and then I'm getting ready for the, uh, for the military draft. And I'm sorry, military draft, NBA draft. NBA draft. I was yeah. going to say, do you still have I, like, uh, I, I must have missed that year. <laughs> <laughs> trigger word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, forgive me. Uh, NBA draft. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in my mind, I had it, a bunch of things had to go just right for me to pursue the NBA to the fullest and for me to pursue uh, the military, the way I wanted to pursue it, you know, uh, one week left to right here or there, and it wasn't going to work. And that, that first year I dealt with some of the blowback of that. You know, I, I envisioned myself coming in as an established, uh, NBA player where I could, uh, set my terms a little bit, so to speak. Uh, actually I, I had to claw my way into the NBA as an undrafted free agent. You know, I was in there by my fingernails and my first year in the NBA, I actually had to delay my, um, <clears throat> delay my commissioning uh, one year, which is something uh, I, I've seen. There's precedence that I've seen cadets do that, whether they're finishing school or they have an extreme job uh, situation or some kind of opportunity. For me, it happened to be the NBA. Yeah. Uh, so I delayed it a year. At that point, I was a little bit more established. I was playing for the New York Knicks, and then I decided to uh, sign up with the New York Army National Guard. It was the uh, most natural uh, selection. Yeah. How was it trying to balance your professional career and and even still the requirements of being an officer? And uh, what were your what was your branch? So initially, I was an AG officer. Okay. Uh, yeah. So a lot of work in human resources, and, yep. and I'll level with you. I, I ended up using basketball more as a platform to try to reach out to different communities within New York and try to help with the recruiting and the retention effort. Uh, and ultimately, it was, it was a a lot of learning for me. Uh, I had some great mentors in the New York Army National Guard that, again, much like Duke, much like uh, General Brown, much like my ROTC professors, they, they appreciated what I was trying to do, and they wanted to help me do that. And they knew it wasn't going to be conventional. Uh, you know, there's sometimes, hey, the, what, it's uh, standard one week in a month, uh, two weeks out of the summer for the National mm-hmm. Guard in terms of your service. 
they'd move quite a few of those weekends uh, that are once a month during the season to the off season. I might spend more time in the off season. The National Guard is a great opportunity. Uh, I, I was really appreciative of them being willing to work with uh, work with me. Uh, but ultimately, when I was there, I, I wish I could say I, I was a, a big contributor, but I was just a, I was a big learner, and I'm lucky that I had a bunch of great teachers in the New York National Guard to help me out. How did your teammates react to that? You know, in terms of sounded like you know you were almost reverse you were using the your mba for an opportunity to help the national guard mm-hmm. rather than you know hey humbly this this is your day job over here you know this is where <laughs> you're supposed to be putting butter is. yeah this is where you're <laughs> supposed to be putting all your energy and effort is around this team mm-hmm. but i you feel know? like uh, I'm, I'm not going to answer the question for you because i wasn't there but i feel like like after knowing him and working with him you know it would have been a hard one for him to handle but um, uh, the, his work ethic is you know I'm unmatched. So I, I would say that I, my guess would be that he put forth such effort that it was maybe noticed that he was there sometimes, but he definitely uh, wasn't slacking off. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of how it played out for me. And teammates, not so much teammates thought it was awesome. We support each other. Uh, and But it's more, it's a tough sell to the front office, some of the administration who has to build the team and run the organization. They, they do want to make sure people are focused. It's a PR thing, too, for them, right? Uh, or was it? Uh, uh, yes and yes and no. I, I didn't uh, deal with that too much. I, I felt like they, uh, they supported me holistically, you know, whether I was in the National Guard or not. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, to Jason's point, I think on paper, you see, okay, we're getting ready to take on this player who uh, isn't a super great player already. I wasn't. I wasn't a great player. And he's also doing the, this uh, this thing on the side with the military. Uh, are we taking on some liability, someone who's not focused? And on paper, it might seem a little uh, awkward, but then when they actually got to work with me and then when you get to put in those reps daily and they see, you know, if I'm getting to the gym before everybody else or if I'm staying later, it's, oh, hey, clearly this isn't impacting him. It's something that makes him better. And it, it's a part of my personality that was kind of tough to hide that I think they saw how it enhanced me. It wasn't a distraction or held me back. And that's why I'd encourage a lot of people to take a look at the National Guard and Reserve, even if you have a civilian path you're, uh, you're passionate about, because it can enhance what you're doing. And some guys will say, oh, I don't have the time. And we'd like to you know, use myself as an example. Hey, I, I was able to play in the NBA and do the National Guard. I, I think yeah. you guys might have more time than you think. And it, it would manifest itself in different ways. I think Carmelo Anthony always called me Captain America was his nickname <laughs> for me. Uh, but yeah, little little fun stuff like that. Yeah. So around the um, this time from what year? Uh, what years are we talking here? Uh, so I gosh, I, I'll try not to screw up the timeline here. Um, in I signed with the New York Knicks in summer of 2016. Okay. I ended up commissioning uh, with the into the New York Army National Guard in. I think it was spring or early summer of 2017. Okay, so uh, not necessarily, I mean, it's still a little bit of the wind down or whatever that's kind of occurring, but your unit ever deploy or were you ever concerned or they're concerned about that? No, um, no, yeah. I, I would say, uh, you know, b- between delaying my commissioning a year uh, already, I, I didn't get a, a ton of time up front with New York National Guard. And then when I did commission, um, it, it was just, uh, it was a learning experience and they tried to plug me in where I, I could be the most effective. Uh, and a lot of times that was visiting high schools, talking to kids about the opportunities in New York national guard. Um, I would go to, uh, you know, different, uh, boroughs within New York city. Um, and, and it was just, it was a great learning experience. I, uh, you know, partly due to my branch, partly due to basketball, sometimes due to off-season surgery I was having. I wasn't doing a, a ton with my hands and my body, uh, but I was uh, learning a lot, and I tried to put my best foot forward, and every time I got to represent the New York National Guard. Yeah. Were you ever um, getting the itch to go active duty, though? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really glad the way the conversation's gone this far, the, all the context has already said I can explain it better now. I like how our conversation's kind of played out. So I, I can tell you that now I, I'd commissioned and I delayed my commissioning a year, but there's something you can't delay for too long. And that's, uh, you've got to go to your bullock. You've got to be stamped as, hey, Marshall, you are an AG officer. And it was getting time for me to, you know, the army had, had been uh, really working with me, but hey, Marshall, we really need you to go to your bullock now. 
And uh, part of the reason I, I picked AG initially was one, it's super rewarding to you know in, empower people and help them you know realize their dreams, help them reach their goals. But two, to be frank, the AG Bullock fit in in, in, uh, in an NBA off season. It was one of the shortest bullocks. It's in Indian- Indianapolis, too, isn't it? Or Indiana, uh, wasn't I, it? You know, I, I trust you. I, I don't know. I, I, think, get... I think so. Yeah. Oh. I know yeah. there's one in Georgia. Interesting. Fort Benning. Does Bullock, I Bullock? Oh, yeah. The, yeah, the I Bullock. Yeah. yeah. Um, but with the AG Bullock, it was getting time to go. And I, uh, at this point, I was playing for the... Uh, for the Los Angeles Clippers. And I was just on their preseason organization. I hadn't made the final roster yet. We were playing preseason games in Hawaii. And now uh, General Robert Brown at this point, he's the PACOM commander and he's out in Hawaii. Oh my God, he just like, you know, it's crazy how, uh, yeah, this worked out. Keep yeah. going, sorry. Uh, and he's the he's coming to watch our games. He helped organize something for the the Clippers. We got to go and visit Pearl Harbor. And, yeah. and again, I'd cite that as an example of, hey, I feel like my military connection adding value to the team and the team appreciated that. Um, but, he, you know, he comes and he watched me play for the Clippers and I, I don't do great. You know, I'm, I'm not playing great. I end up getting cut from the roster and... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really giving this basketball thing my all. I, I have a, a surgery coming up on a knee that's not not doing super hot. Um, and he he didn't force me. Uh, he didn't uh, pressure me in any way. But he was a positive influence on me throughout. And I, I'm getting to see the kind of work he's doing in Hawaii and the legacy he's having. And he, he, he I promise, he wasn't taking digs at how I was playing poorly or anything. But the timing uh, was kind of perfect. And that, hey, I wasn't wasn't doing super hot. Uh, basketball thing was kind of trailing off. And I got to look at the impacts he was making and the legacy he was leaving. I thought, man, that's pretty awesome. And it, it just it looked more awesome to me uh, that through through that lens. Uh, than anything I'd seen before. So yes, I started to feel that itch more to want to go to active duty. Really pushed through, uh, you know, some of the knee stuff. I, I pushed through going down to the G League, uh, the minor league of the uh, the NBA, and I managed to get called up one more time. I got called up to the Milwaukee Bucks uh, to help them a little bit. A lot of fun. Really enjoyed the experience. At the end of it, though, hey Marshall, you need knee surgery. You can't go on anymore. Uh, also, we need you to go to Bullock. And between those two, uh, and kind of taking a look in the mirror, and, and that I, I feel like I've, I've done what I've wanted to do in the basketball world. I'm really proud. I, I probably won't end up being an all-star anytime soon, uh, but I don't want to regret giving this uh, Army thing a, a real shot. Uh, that's what uh, convinced me to, when I called Coach K, and then I called General Brown, we had a conversation, and uh, I made the decision to switch to active duty and switch branches. I switched from uh, AG to infantry. So you still talk to Coach K? Oh, yeah, absolutely. As a mentor, called him back up and just said, hey, that's that's really interesting. I mean, for yeah. that long mm-hmm. away that, one, you would look at him as, as being a powerful influence in that way in your in your life, and, and we're talking number of years later, um, but two, you know, how much, obviously, um, I don't know, from his perspective, that's that's a sign of a true leader. Yes. You know? Yeah. Uh, I, it shocks me with all the former players Coach K has, not only former players, but some that have gone on to do amazing things, uh, you know, in the basketball world, that he makes time for, you know, the Marshall Plumleys. He, he, I don't know how he has enough time in the day. Uh, you know, when I, I'm sure he, he's probably talking to Kyrie Irving or Zion Williamson, he'll still he'll, <laughs> yeah. he'll take a call. No, just dro- a name drop here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get that tip. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he's on one side, he's dealing with that, but he'll still make just as much time for a guy like me. And yeah. I, I think that really speaks, like you were saying, to the kind of leader he is. And Dave, Dave Elder talking to me, and, I, and that, that, I, I, there's no comparison for the audience, but to me, it's the same thing because you know Dave's a huge businessman. That's the way I wanted to go, and you know, it's coaches, you know, what he is. I don't, I don't really know Coach Elder going yeah. basketball, but I know he's a huge icon. Yeah, and that's so awesome to see how powerful the Daves can be in your life, and the Coach K's can be in their, your life, not just being there with you throughout, but those those very pivotal moments. And I know you guys have helped each other in pivotal moments. This was one of my pivotal moments. Uh, and so really appreciative for, uh, for Coach K taking the time. And I, I, I've told him, you know, you, you don't want to put anyone uh, 
any one person on a pedestal too much because we're human. You know, humans can disappoint you, and yeah. no one's infallible. Uh, but I have found when I, I live my life in, in, in a way that I'm trying to, you know, make Coach K proud. Normally, I'm doing pretty good because uh, he's, he's got pretty good values. So I, uh, I'm, I'm my own man. You know, I, I have things that drive me. But I'd be lying if I, I didn't keep that in the back of my mind, you know, with these decisions, with these steps I'm taking in my career, you know, hey, I'd like to make Coach K proud. Yeah, in leadership, I mean, that's really what we want to try to do. We've talked about it before and even other episodes mm-hmm. about creating those foundational things. And if we can leave that kind of foot, that kind of impression um, to where – what would First Sergeant Belford do? Mm. You know, what would Dave do in this situation? Or better yet, why don't I just pick up the phone and call Dave, <laughs> you know, and, and ask him about it. What should I do? Um, that means a lot as well, a leader. Yeah. I mean, one of the most, you know, best, best feelings I can think of as a leader <clears throat> is I've, I've had, you know, guys call me in the middle of the night, you know, that, that got out of the Army that I used to, you know, be in charge of or it's still in the Army and, you know, not necessarily at midnight, but uh, just call and ask questions. You know, um, actually, uh, Dave was with me, and uh, he's like, "Hey, uh, guy, sent me a text. Like, hey, my my first sergeant can't answer this question. I don't know why, but do you have the answer to it?" And I was like, "Yeah, give me about ten minutes." And I went outside, called him, and he's like, "Hey, man, thanks." So like, just to, you know, the, the guy still lean on you like that. You it makes you feel like you left something implanted, you know, somewhere, and and you did you, you did good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I still remain in contact with guys that I served with a long time ago, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, I hate to say that, that it makes me seem really old, but which I am. But um, <laughs> it, when you go back that far and you think about those guys are still remaining friends, and they're truly my friends. They, I mean, I may have been in E7 and they were E4s, and, and, you know, but they were they were still right there with me. And today they're right there with me. And it means a lot, you know, and and. Again, I think it's it's just one of those things. It's a sign of a good leader. Um, I, I guess I can give myself credit for that too. But of of having people that's in your life that are, um, you know, will pick up the phone and call you and ask you for suggestions and everything else. And obviously, Jenna Brown was one of those individuals, and he was still a very you know important role in your life. And um, was he the one that said infantry, or is that? just you at this point that just decided eh, maybe for active duty infantry would be a better career route for officer. Yeah. I, I think up until that point, I'd really been limiting myself uh, just because I, I, I tried to uh, be realistic. Like, Hey, Marshall, you're seven feet tall. You know, where are you going to be helpful? Uh, and I got some hard nose on things so like, Hey, armor. No, you know, it's not going to work out or aviation. No, your seated height is too great for, you know, for a lot of these birds you can yeah, fly. I was, I was in armor. I could only imagine you being a tank commander and kicking me in the back of the head all the time. It already happens bad enough as a gunner, yeah. but wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so I got the, a few hard nose and I got a few things where they said, well, you, you know, you could, but it'd probably be a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, infantry yeah. fell into that category. And I, I've always been realistic with myself up to that point. Hey, you know, I probably shouldn't do something where I, I'm, I'm going to be really out there. I don't want to be a liability. I don't want to stand out too bad. And then, but when you're in those uh, those kind of heated moments where I'm getting ready to make a leap of faith to a new career, I'm kind of like, you know, screw it. I'm if I'm going to do this thing, let's really do it. Yeah. Uh, and in my eyes, and in terms of what drove me and uh, the kind of guys I was passionate about being around. That, that's what infantry meant to me. That was really kind of a full sin. That was, hey, let's really do it. That's what it looked like to me. Uh, so that, that's uh, how I arrived at infantry. And, uh, no, I'm, I, <laughs> there have definitely been uh, times that, that have been less convenient for me than someone maybe shorter. Uh, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm proud to say, you know, I, I felt like I was able to contribute and do everything else the guys on my left and right could do. What, uh, how, first off, how old are you? Uh, right now, 29. So... I want you to think about that age, right? Like, like think of the. <clears throat> this is significant, I think. It's, uh, you know, look at some of the young um, population nowadays, and like the maturity level obviously goes up and down between the rest of them. But like, it, this is 29 years old. I'm about to decide whether I want to be uh, 11 Bravo or 11 Alpha or not. But look at up to that point, the years. Like, this just talks to your character because look up to those years, like the level of mature decisions. Thought, th- thought process. Some of which he had yeah, to do so early just because of going into 
NFL, right. I, I, I mean, an NBA, I'm sorry, geez, NFL, <laughs> NBA, and you're going into a professional sport. I'm going to juggle both these things at the same time, and I'm going to do, like, the level of, like, that's, that speaks to your character and, and your thought process and thinking through the problem before you even get in the Army to be taught how to think through a problem and how to how to have, you know, multiple, you know, um, objectives objectives, and all that stuff. Like, you were doing that before you ever had the training to do it. That, that's just amazing. No, I, I really appreciate you saying that. And I would uh, – I think one thing we all have in common in this room is we like to surround ourselves with good people, Dave. That's why you're here. Jason, you're here. And, you know, I uh, – I'd like to think I, I showed some some wisdom and uh, I, I exercised some good judgment, but I, I I'd put maybe you know ten percent on that, ninety percent on I, I had a really good team I was on, and and I mean team not just Duke but Duke New York Army National Guard, my family. I'm talking about the, kind of the holistic, the the big team. Uh, so I uh, I feel like I've gotten to do a lot of the really cool things in my life, and I've been able to avoid some of the pitfalls, uh, make some of those good decisions you talked about, just because I had some some great teammates, and I, I can't uh, as much as I'd like to. I, I probably got to give all the credit to them. Giving it back too, like <clears throat> like that, you know, that's that, that's true humility too. Like he's been pretty humble all the way through it. But uh, I, one of the things I try to do as a leader, you know, uh, to match that, you know, coming up the ranks is. Like I was telling the other day with the platoon sergeant job, like, I, you know, we had a good, we had a successful platoon in two alpha, but um, those guys carried me on their back. You know what I mean? Like they, they're the ones that had the the, the bruised up hands. Being like, come on, Sarge. Um, I definitely haven't. I'm not sitting here in, in my first sergeant seat based off of what I, my capabilities are. It's it's the guys that I, I leaned on when I had absolutely no idea what the hell I was doing. The people that recognize that though are the ones that become most successful. So the fact that you recognize that um, already speaks very highly. And of course, you know, I already think highly of you anyway. But I mean, I'm just saying that there are individuals that sometimes thinks it's all about you know it's all where they got was always about them mm -hmm. and. You know, that, that's a sign, of, again, of a good leader. You arrive at OBC, I guess, at Fort Benning. Is, um, what was that? You know, you're walking in the door. You're learning how to be an infantryman. Did you find it a little bit challenging now in this new MOS? Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, my ROTC experience, I, I told you, was pretty unconventional. And there were some things, like I was coming in, too, with I Bullock at, at uh, Fort Benning to become an infantry officer, I was maybe more prepared for than the guy on my left and right. And then, I don't know, I could have missed the one odd day of the beginning of class in ROTC where they covered something very fundamental. Uh, and th th there would be some things I do during I Bullock where the guys on my left and right are like, their jaws would drop. Marshall, I can't believe you didn't know not to, <laughs> not to fill up your canteens there. That's the last time we're getting water for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where's the, you know, where are the managers? Where are the water bottles? You know, <laughs> definitely a buy yourself type item right there. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, I, I do think a, a lot of the, uh, the, the things that worked for me in basketball translated just well, and, and the, the guys in the military, they appreciated it. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of pushback. A lot of people took it on as, wow, we appreciate your, your fresh perspective, Marshall. That's really creative. Uh, and for me, I, I don't consider myself a creative person. I, I think, Dave, we've talked a little bit about this, but it, it was just normal for me. It was just normal for me in a completely different career field in basketball. Uh, but what was normal for me was was new and maybe innovative for a uh, way to approach some problems with my new teammates with uh, these I Bullock second lieutenants. Uh, so I, I maybe came off as more creative than I was. Uh, and then again, I, I slipped up on some very basic stuff. And then I, I was probably better prepared at a, a few other things. Uh, ruck marches among them. I'm pretty good at walking. Huh. Well, I, I, yeah, you cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time, I'm sure. Yeah, it's a nat natural gift. I can't say I, I had ever had to work at that too hard. <laughs> so what about um, afterwards? Did you end up going to Airborne or Ranger School? Because, you know, isn't it every officer you either have a story or you got a tab? Uh, yeah. So, you know, in your case, uh, was it Airborne before Ranger or did you go Ranger and then back to... I went Ranger and then I went Airborne. Yeah, and some do. Yeah. The weird thing you talk about what you're good and bad at something that's so it's so tiny, but it, it's been a huge part of my development. I'm telling you, huge push-ups, and it, it sounds silly. <laughs> uh, it's such a minor thing, but I barely did the minimum to become an Ibolic officer. Uh, I did the, barely did the minimum to pass. And here I am, I'm a professional athlete. I've worked on my body. 
I worked with all these trainers. I did everything. And so I, I basically, I, I had to do a look in the mirror. And I said, hey, Marshall, you think you know stuff. You don't know anything. And we, we got to figure this out. Uh, so I, I started with people's conventional wisdom. The I gotta old find this damn mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Let me buy one. Off of you. Mirror, mirror on <laughs> Marshall's wall. <laughs> Please help me out, damn it. <laughs> the uh, the uh, you were talking about the push-ups and everything. Yeah. So wh- why was the why were the push-ups so difficult for you? Was it because of your height? Um, or it was something of that uh, nature, or was it just you know, yeah, not yeah. working on that muscle group? Yeah, I, I think a little bit of both. And then at a certain point, you do pour enough at them, it becomes a mental thing a little yeah. bit as well. Uh, but you know, you got the longer levers, you've got you know, the the, the physics checks out that it's going to be harder for me to do them. Yeah, because uh, like I knew a, he's like a C5, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like he can do the work, he just yeah. takes a well, hell I, of I say that, off the land. I, I knew a guy from Guam, and I think I've shared this on the podcast, but this guy, when I served with him and stuff, he was a beast man he had like i wanted his thighs because every time he walked they just roll you know with this <laughs> muscle and everything right and he looked like a bodybuilder but on the pt test he couldn't uh do the two mile run because by the time he did the push-ups it wasn't the push-ups it was the setups that got him he used his thigh muscle because he was so mm. short he used all of his thighs to do his setup so when he ran mm. his his muscle and his thighs were cramping on him yeah uh, you know, his, his stomach and uh, thighs and everything. So he, like, we'd almost have to try to help uh, him cross the, the finish line. Yeah. And so I think of short, and now you're talking about tall, immediately I thought of my buddy from Guam yeah. and the challenges he had. Yeah, and, and for me, it turned into this whole journey. One, you know, I'm coming from an athletic background where really I got to reach the levels I did because I was really either gifted or I, I was just talented. I was doing stuff I was good at. Now I'm in this new arena. Hey, you're a seven foot guy that gets measured by how well you can do body weight exercises. Uh, it was, I was the most uh, self-defeating athlete ever. It's like, oh, I'm built great for a basketball court, but this isn't uh, and super humbling. So I was humbled. And then it started this whole journey for me. I ended up, you know, free weekends, I was going to strength and conditioning conferences. I was driving around the country. I was meeting with coaches. I was having them put together very specific plans for me because I, you got to believe me, you know, I made it to the NBA. I know what it takes to perform athletically, how you got to treat your body, how you got to eat. And sometimes when you hear someone's not doing well on a part of a PT test, you, you chalk it up to discipline. And I, I promise you, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't discipline. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was trying it. Yeah. Um, in any ways, it, it was this huge journey came out of something so small, something that people normally uh, overlook or don't give to, just push-ups. And uh, the, you know. I would say, I want to, <laughs> I like to do this sometimes, but I want to talk about, think about, like, he's talking about a journey, right? Like, for push-ups, for programs, you know? like Think about, like, the, the dudes that we get, they're like, I just can't pass the push-ups, all right? I'm like, what? He's, like, doing literally, like, Next level, like SpaceX shit to do. <laughs> yeah, a phone a friend of people who are PTs of how can I do this and work on it and taking trips to places of like how you do pushups. <laughs> yeah, and I got I, we got privates in the army. They're like, I just can't, I don't know why I can't get better. Yeah, I'm like, listen to this podcast and listen to Marshall Pummy talk. That's why, because uh, you can do that. You can do it. You got to put time, effort, and motivation in it. Yeah, thank no, you for that. No, I, I appreciate it. And again, I, I got, I ended up surround. We talk about surrounding ourselves with good people. I ended up sur- surrounding myself with even more, uh, you know, even cooler people through this process. Started out, I hit up my trainer with the Milwaukee Bucks. Hey, what do you think I should do? Well, there's this strength coach, uh, Cal Dietz, who, who's really on to some good stuff. He might help with your, your length and your leverage. And anyways, I ended up driving to South Carolina to meet with uh, Cal Dietz. And Cal Dietz is at this uh, Sorenex. I'm sure you've maybe heard the brand in gyms. Sorenex, if you ever get the chance. Oh, no, actually, I haven't. Yeah, minor plug for them. They do something called Sorenex Summer Strong, where it's a convention where they bring together people, honestly, like you guys. Uh, that just, you know, titans of their industry, good people, yeah. uh, and they, they share all these ideas, but a little bit of an athletic focus. Uh, so I, I got to meet with even more people there. And then I ended up meeting with a, a major Donald Bigham, uh, who was uh, a big part of Fort Benning, and he was a, a, one of the major minds behind the new uh, ACFT. <laughs> and so I was getting it from, you know, uh, a guy that might be, you know, innovative and a scientist. I was getting it from a guy, kind of the horse's mouth, the guy who designs <laughs> these army tests. And uh, just, just, just to get this set, yeah. let's just be real what we're talking right. about here. Push-ups. 
Push yeah. ups. Push ups. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. If it, you're out there in the army and you you know you love <laughs> uh, to do great on PT test and you want to do the best, listen to Marshall, and please put forth that well, effort. And you're trying to get the minimum <laughs> qualification. Yes. So, I mean, most of the guys would look at the minimum <laughs> qualification. Yeah, that's all I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because people see me. I'm a seven-foot guy. I have a, yeah. a presence. I don't think anyone's ever accused me of looking unathletic. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they just assume. But I'm like, no, you, you'd be amazed at the things I, I struggle with uh, that you know keep me up at night. That's humility, <laughs> that, that, that's humility right uh, there, you know? So anyway, obviously you were able to get through that. Uh, was it then a struggle to meet additional requirements, like for you know the Ranger School or anything like that, to get ready for it? Yeah. Uh, so it, he, uh, I ended up working with the, these different people I met. I uh, got ready just fine for Ranger School. I passed those minimums, and I, I think there were some people that were kind of uh, poo-pooing or not super worried about the minimum uh, standards. Hey, we'll be fine. And they ended up, you know, coming up short. Uh, and I'm like, no, I appreciate how serious these were from the from the onset. And I, I, I kind of noticed a theme about that with, with some of my peers, not all of them. But some of them will come into ranger school and they'll say, hey, you know what? No matter how long it takes, I'm going to get through ranger school. Uh, I don't care how long it takes. And, and for me, I'm like, you should care a little bit. <laughs> how long it takes. You will care a little bit in a little while. <laughs> Uh, the, you, like some kind of sense of urgency and some guys, you know, you go into one of your looks at one of the phases. Hey, I'm probably going to get three looks here. This is one of my looks. No, you got to, that's your only mm-hmm. look and that's how you got to treat it. I used to tell uh, dudes that when I was a cert cadre, you know, I would do walk, walk, walk the, uh, the PEs and stuff. I'd, I'd be like, don't bank on getting another look. I was like, cause you might not. And if you get no go on that first look, we'll see you next class like and they're like oh, what i thought we all just get two looks i was like you're not guaranteed anything but one you take it <laughs> <laughs> yeah obviously that's how you were approaching it yeah you know? I, I i tried to and that's something i think uh i've gotten to, coach k always said it and it's it's a simple word but yeah he, the meaning he puts behind it and getting to hang around with him he has a deep appreciation for moments and moments and how pivotal they can be and how quick they can be gone and how you wish you were ready for them. Mm. Um, I remember uh-huh. the, the first time I was putting a, a game for Duke and they called my name and I, I, I took off, stood up, I took off my jersey and I, you know, I went up to this course at Marshall, sit down, you're not ready, you know, you're not ready. And I didn't, I didn't realize it. Sat for a couple of games, that lesson, I, I remembered it. But the next time he called my name, my, my uh, warm up was already off. I was sitting on the, the bench in a way that I was ready to spring up off of it. And when he calls my name, I sprint to the score table. That's ready. That's when you're ready for your moment. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, you put like Velcro. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you put like Velcro seams. And <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really deep. Yeah. He's, he's phenomenal, and he's, he's got some books out there, and you get the chance to hear him speak. Uh, if I say anything that ever sounds profound, it's just I'm regurgitating something he said. I, I, don't, I don't have an original thought in me, but, um, yeah, that, that helped me also through the NBA draft process. And uh, I, I wanted to do everything. I didn't know how it would pay dividends, but I wanted to do everything. I wanted to do all these little things right in the, the pre-draft process. And, uh, you know... I, I tried to not just on the court do the right things. You got to perform, but off the court, I tried to do all the little things. And then I went through the draft process. And I didn't get drafted. And for a moment there, I had a really bad attitude. You know, these things we're talking about appreciating the little things like the push ups. We're talking about Coach K in these moments. For a, mo- for a split second there, I was like, man, screw all that. You know, that, that, I did it all. It didn't help me. You were a McDonald's high school player, <laughs> and you didn't get, you know, you, you had a tough go in, in college, and then you didn't get drafted. I mean, you talk about ego checks along yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> yeah. When you talk about uh, adverse, everybody has different adversities to overcome, you know what I mean? Think about, like, what he's he's got his dreams on the nba you know what i mean some people are just trying to get in the army yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean he got the dreams on the nba but he, the 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 level of you know what that adversity was to come, overcome for one person you know like myself to do that and him to you know, the nba the, both the efforts were equal to same to, to accomplish those goals so it doesn't matter what the hell you're going to put your effort into as long as that's you know you're giving it like you said and using those moments and that that mentality like you can do it yeah yeah and i i i'll tell you I finished this draft process and I was undrafted. I was sitting there for about a day. 
undrafted and I, all the th- great things we're talking about, I condemned it all. I'm like, hey, you know, screw these. I've had it. You know, the, the small things don't matter. I did them all. Didn't amount to anything. Uh, and then my agent calls me into his office and he's uh, negotiating a, a bidding war for me right now as an undrafted free agent. And the, the bidding war starts, it escalates, escalates. And uh, I, uh, I'm like, man, if they like me this much, they should have just drafted me. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but ultimately, you know, I hear my agent say, uh, I think he's talking to the Knicks and he says, hey, well, if you offer that, we'll sign right now. Uh, which I know had to be good because he didn't even run it by me. <laughs> uh, but so no, the, the Knicks ended up offering me a, a fully guaranteed, uh, the first year fully guaranteed a three-year contract. Basically, I, I had a fully guaranteed contract, so it was the first 30 picks in the NBA draft, and Marshall Plumley had a fully guaranteed uh, contract the wow. day after the draft. And uh, I asked my agent, you know, hey, why? Uh, what, what's some of the stuff that came out of this? And they said, hey, they noticed... Um, you know, you wrote uh, you wrote those like forty thank you notes that you hand wrote and you sent to all the coaches that you worked out for. Like that little thing, some of the guys they hadn't they hadn't seen that. Um, <laughs> they really awesome. appreciated that. Um, <clears throat> they said, you know, hey, the Knicks they caught you on on video camera after after the workout. You were in the cafeteria. You cleaned up the tables and you pushed in the chairs. They saw that and they liked that. Uh, so it, it, it I, I like to tell people the NBA isn't the top four hundred and fifty most talented players in the world. I think it's like the top hundred talented player in the world. And then whoever those guys want to play with. <laughs> yeah. And they, they want guys with, with good attitudes and are going to be about the team. And it, it's funny. I was just telling you, I was condemning these little things. Why did I do all those little things? That wasn't worth it. And really the only reason I ever got a chance to play in the NBA at all was because of the little things, the honestly, the things that, some people think have nothing to do with basketball. There are books written about what you just described there about <laughs> when no one's looking, when the camera's not on, what are you doing? How are you carrying yourself then? Because that's truly the measure of who you are as a person. And so, I mean, thankfully they had those video cameras available where they could watch <laughs> you or whatever. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a very important lesson because I think so many guys try to be on in the moment when it matters, when they think it matters the most. And yet it's those simple gestures and those things when no one, when you didn't know anybody was looking, we call that somebody was paying rangers. attention. Yeah. We call yes. those spotlight rangers in the army. So I'm the non-military guy in the bunch. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here really amazed at your story. And we got to spend a little time together, you know, a few days ago on the telephone. But when I think back at you're 29 years old, and so over the last 10 years, we're talking about these mentors that's been in your life, your coaches and your military mentors, but over the, the first portion of your life, uh, what you're saying is what I want my, my kids to be like. And, and as a mentor to them, I want to be all these things that, that your mentors have been to you. Where did that really start? I, uh, Again, it's, it's my easy button, but I, I feel like I, I do have to point it to a lot of it to Coach K. I, I am really proud of uh, or thankful for my parents, and you got to give them credit, and I'm, I'll never be able to pay them back. You're making huge plugs for Duke right now. Mm-hmm. Just <laughs> <saying>. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, Good uh, job, Coach. <laughs> In terms of like a, a appreciation for those small, small, easily overlooked moments, I uh, I I just think of uh, the times I was being scolded by Coach K saying, "Hey Marshall, you turned the ball over here. It's just a turnover. It's not a big deal." No, Marshall, you don't get it. That turnover led to it. This guy scoring a point. That guy had been shooting bad all night. He just got an easy layup off your turnover. That was a turning point for him. He's going to go on and have a great game. We were just about to shut him down and all of that because you turned it over. Wow. And that pivotal point. <laughs> you, you don't appreciate the second and third order effects. I'm like, wow. I, I thought it was just. A, I thought it was just a whoopsie. Uh, it turns out there aren't a lot of just whoopsies. Everything <laughs> there are consequences in second and third order. So. I realize, uh, hey, writing these 40 letters to these teams, a lot of them might not get it. It's, it's just a letter. No, it's not just a letter. This could be the one letter that could find the right person who's the decision maker that could make could be the final vote into whether I get on the team. And uh, so I got, I got an appreciation of the moments. I really, my earliest memories of having it broken down for me like that come from Coach K. Uh, but no, I, I got a grocery list of people I got to thank, and uh, you make a good point. One thing my parents did for me uh, that was uh, really tough for them, just to segue a little bit, 
is they made a really tough decision. They, they let me go to boarding school. Uh, and that wasn't, you know, people go to boarding schools for d- different reasons. Some people, they send their kids away because, you know, they don't want any part of them. Sometimes that happens, unfortunately. Right. In ours, it was a case where my parents said, hey, you know, as much as, as proud as we are of ourselves, we don't feel like we can teach you everything. We've got to trust someone else to be able to teach you some. And there's this special environment where you can you can start figuring stuff out. So... Uh, man, that's a really good question you asked. I'm trying to look at where it started. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think my parents had a foundation. I started getting exposed to different perspectives and different leaders, getting out of my comfort zone at a boarding school. And then, uh, man, Coach K did it in such a way, uh, with, with such attention to detail that I hadn't had before. And did you have a relationship with Coach K because of your older brothers? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that started early. Was um, was that a good or bad thing, right? <laughs> because you got do you have to live in their shoes? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Coach K, like a lot of great leaders, like like yourselves, I'm sure, like you, trying to be a father, he he doesn't take a cookie cutter approach with his players, uh, and he gets to know them, them uh, what drives them intimately, deeply, by putting them in these these tough situations and seeing how you react, seeing the kind of person you are, where, where you're strong, where you're weak. And he helps you overcome those weaknesses. And, and he doesn't, uh, hey, say something's a strength, we're going to leave it alone. He said, no, we're going to work on that. That could be your calling card. <laughs> Anyways, with, with that a- approach, he evaluates players. And to me, I honestly don't think I could be any more different of a player to him than I- I'm just as different from Miles and Mason Plumley as I am from Jaleel Okafor or Zion Williamson. He, he just, he, he really gives a, a particular attention and detail to each player and getting to know them. Uh, so, you know, the, I'd say in terms of how he treats us, he treats me, uh, again, I just as, as different as any other player. And I, I say that in a good way. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, no, it really is. And so here we are now in Ranger School. Any problems uh, as you go through the program and stuff once you get in? And did you have to recycle? Or I always ask that question because, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I actually, uh, I didn't have to recycle. Uh, I ended up linking up with a squad full of those half uh, enlisted uh, Rangers from 375. Uh, it's funny, they're, they're, now I'm in Ranger Regiment. We, hey, I know you. <laughs> um, but half enlisted Ranger Regiments, half I Bullock uh, junior officers. And there are stereotypes out there that, hey, we're not going to mix well. We're going to be like oil and water. We got along great. We held each other really accountable. And our whole squad, we went all straight through together. We didn't recycle at all. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really uh, it, it was awesome that we we got to be close enough to each other that when someone had a, a look, hey, it's Marshall Marshall's look. No, it wasn't Marshall's look. This is our look. We all want to get him his go. We're all getting through. Somewhere I feel like um, you may have played a key role. No, being able to bring that team together no. yeah. and, and, you know, driving those points and like building those men up to where they needed to be, to be prepared to do. I mean, cause not everybody positions. has those foundational pieces no. you just described. Hell no, they don't. And then, and then take them into ranger school where you're supposed to learn that a little bit. Yeah. You know? and well, it, I, I, I tried and I, I definitely, I think I helped at different points, but man, I, they, they carried me at different points and ranger school. It, it super humbling and I, I i can't lie to you i gotta look you guys in the eye and, and tell you like there were points where i looked back or if you saw a video clip if there was a camera like there was with the knicks of what you saw me do you would have been disappointed oh man marshall that's not that's not you um and so overall trended positive we all made mo- more good decisions than we did bad decisions but those times when you're really tired really sleepy really hungry and you, you fall asleep pulling security and you didn't mean to oh man why'd i do that you know that time when i'm going up to the the layout of all the, the weapons that you could carry up the mountain and uh you know you, you don't pick the heaviest one uh it's like uh, you know i'm ashamed of that I, I gotta live with that but i also i remember and i keep that in the back of my mind hey marshall next time you get really tired uh you get really worn down you you know how you can screw up you know what what your weaknesses are you're going to reach for that lighter weapon next time that happens i'm not i'm not going to do that again uh so i it was not a perfect rep of ranger school even though uh, we didn't recycle there there were humbling moments moments I, i wish i could do over but uh the moments i wish i could do over are lessons now that i get to carry forward Marshall, I got to tell you, 
I'd never do ranger school again, but I'd have sure deal with you. I, I mean, no doubt. But, but not only that, but it's like most people going through ranger school are just not picking up those moments no. like you are. I mean, they're just, it. right. And they're like, eh, no, I'm not looking back on that again. And refle- There's no reflections I want of that. Uh, but the way you analyze life. Beautiful. It's, it really is amazing. Um I don't know that most people, I, I mentioned, I think I, um, I, I don't think it was, uh, but a couple of episodes ago, I asked somebody about, are you taking the time to really slow down and smell the roses through life here as you're going through it? Because, you know, in this person's um, case, they were 12 years in uh, military service. And when you get over that hump, it goes by really fast. Those last eight, you know, 10 years, whatever uh, space you may be in and such, um, having done 20 the last 10 was a blur for me, you know? And so I was asking the question of, are you really slowing down to, to pay attention, to absorb it, to really feel it? And yet it sounds like that's something you do all the time. You're constantly in reflection, self-reflection, um, assessment. Um, how can I do better? You know, and obviously it's those things that, you know, Dave asked you about that you went through, but those are things sometimes we don't learn into a very later stage of our life to where, damn, I wish I'd have done that and I'm going to start doing it now because I'm missing out on my kids growing up. I'm missing out on, you know, the things that are going around me. You're assessing that and realizing that at a very young age. You're, well, it's commendable. Your, your mindfulness is, you know, that we talk about doing mindfulness in the Army all the time. And, you know, you've been through the uh, the, the cognitive stuff for RAS too. Um like, did, I feel like you probably were given some insight in those situations in, in RAS2 to help those people understand what mindfulness really is and how to use it and apply it every day. That had, you, were you, were you, did, you had, did you do that? Yeah. Uh, and I, I, gosh, I've overused this expression, uh, but RAS2, you know, I, I know we can't uh, talk about the details of it, but right. it is, if I could describe it, it is a, a very brutal, uh, like a brutally honest look in the mirror. Uh, mm. Again, they'll, they'll uh, I think it was uh, Jeff Van Gundy uh, told me when he was coaching me with the USA team, he said, Marshall, I'm going to be one of the only truth tellers in your life. He's like, me and Coach K will be the truth tellers. He said, your parents, they love you too much to tell you if you're fat or if you're not playing well. I'm going to tell you when you're fat and when you... And, and he laid that out for me, and that's really what RAS2 was. They were truth tellers, and they, uh, they laid it out, all out on the table. Hey, Marshall, you know, in, in high pressure, tough situations, this is where you do well, this is where you struggle. And they, they didn't mince words because they wanted to stick, and it, it, it did stick. And uh, to, to your point, I, I, I do try to, to be reflective and uh, not just uh, – you know, dance through these moments, but appreciate them because uh, you can learn lessons from them that you can carry forward. Uh, I think one pitfall uh, that I struggle with sometimes is you can you can maybe waste too much energy and uh, emotion on some things that have already passed or, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll be so worried about a, a PowerPoint slide that I'm sending up to my leaders because I thought, hey, this could be the moment. This could be the one that this, this slide could change the world. When really it get it, it's not. Yeah, it, <laughs> it checks the block. Yeah, and, yeah, it gets glanced at, and it's like, wow, Marshall, was that an efficient use of your energy and your time? Would that time have been better spent uh, helping somewhere else, some other part of the organization? So uh, overall, I, I think it's worked out for me uh, in terms of you know reflecting, uh, appreciating these moments, putting the energy into the moments. But when I'm performing poorly, it's normally because I, I I tip over. I I, I put uh, maybe too much in and. I'm, uh, you know, wasting a lot of, I'm being inefficient with my energy and emotion, putting them into to the wrong things. Uh, so uh, I've got to catch myself every now and then. I think you're just really too hard on yourself. And measuring probably the rest of it. Yeah, you know. so, so I'm just curious, what do you do for fun? So for fun, that, that's something I've, uh, I've had to work on because I, I think Jason, you, you see me around work, and, and most people would say they see me with a smile on my face. Uh, uh, I'm I'm genuinely having fun with my work, and and work uh, work is fun for me. Uh, so uh, m- maybe staying a little late at the office might might seem like oh I'm working overtime, but for me I'm just in the place where I'm having fun. So uh, re- really have been blessed to get to do things that I love between basketball and the army. 
in terms of actually developing hobbies, uh, that's something I, I've had to uh, I've had to work on a little bit here and getting out of my comfort zone. I'm living right next to the Chattahoochee River here in Georgia, and uh, I, I learned that hey, the white water in the Chattahoochee River it's not just any white water. You know, it, it's uh, it's some of the best for freestyle kayakers, something of that nature. Uh, so I'm like, hey, I, I'm not going to regret living here, not giving it a whirl. So I've started taking <laughs> kayaking lessons, yes. which has been its whole endeavor because I don't really fit in a kayak. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we were we were imaging, yeah, trying to image that when, yeah. you, when you were talking. And I ask them about the river, and I have instructors. They say, hey, it's a safe river. You can't touch the bottom, you know, this and that. And on one of my first lessons, I roll over in the kayak and I hit my head on a rock on the bottom of the, <laughs> the, bottom of the ocean. And I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He said, you know, hey, well, we thought you couldn't touch the bottom, but I think you can. <laughs> uh, Thanks, coach. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I've been doing that for fun. Um, I do a, uh, I did a little bit of whitewater uh, raft uh, guiding. Uh, my guide name is Tiny. If you ever go down to the Whitewater Express <laughs> and ask for Tiny, uh, it's fun for me. And you know that they they offer you, you know, hey, we'll pay you to go down the river. I do it for free because it's uh, it's just fun for me. Um, but yeah, I, I'm working on developing those hobbies. Uh, I'm working on finding those things and. You know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna segue a little bit here. I touched briefly on my boarding school experience, yeah. uh, and what was really powerful lesson I took away from that was we had this sign up board on the wall uh, of different things you can do to get off campus. Your only way to get off campus, otherwise you're you're kind of locked down there. Hmm. And it'd be different opportunities like kayaking. It would be like, hey, do you want to go shrimping in Charleston, South Carolina? And with, with reckless abandon, I would just sign up for things I didn't even know what I was signing up for. And it, it'd blow my mind the things I'd find out that I was passionate about or I could have fun doing that I would have never thought. I would have never thought I uh, enjoyed uh, shrimping, uh, but I l loved it. It was a lot of fun. And I've thought of my, my life like that to some extent as one big high school sign-up board. You know, hey, uh, you can't do the military and uh, basketball. No, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and sign up for both of them. I'll figure it out, but I'm going to go ahead and sign up for them. <laughs> Uh, and so I've gotten to do those things and hey, you know, kayaking, I'll, I'll give it a whirl here. Um, I don't know if there's been one underlying theme in terms of hobbies or things I do outside of work that I keep going back to. I do like signing up for new stuff. Uh, if I'm not careful, I think I might go down the route of being a, a jack of all trades, master of none. Don't don't want that. There's nothing wrong with that either. You know, nothing I'm, wrong with that. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, uh, I was like, it sounds like you over there. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few of us in the room that are probably that way. Uh, but, you know, okay, so let's get back to um, the military side of things in your career. After this, have you gone through airborne school and ranger school? Uh, any challenges in airborne school, just out of curiosity from the height standpoint? Or? Yeah, they, they genuinely made, or I'm sorry, generally made me first jumper. I think for one jump, I wasn't first jumper uh, just because I feel fine. Uh, but I think the people in front of me and behind me in the stack get a little sketched out because uh, I'm, you know, I'm this big seven foot guy. That, <laughs> Humping over that yeah. part of it or uh, standing yeah. under the bottom of his pack tray. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> like, it, it's true. Everyone uh, for these airborne jumps, they're very conscious of space. They don't want to be, uh, get the, their static line tangled with yours. Oh yeah. And here I take up an enormous amount of space and you stick your arm out with your static line to get arms distance and, I'm jamming up everything, um, and also where your static line hangs from, there's a, a cable running length of the aircraft, and I have to duck underneath it. Uh, so for me to not be first jumper, I, I have to do one duck under the cable, hand off my static line, and then do another duck uh, out of the door. And I think the instructors just looked at that and said, no, you know, scratch that. We're just going to make you the first jumper. Um, so I, I, I've been fine with, I don't know any different. I don't know any better uh, <laughs> to put it in perspective. <clears throat> yeah. I'm six foot tall. I have to reach up and grab the cable to hook, pull it a little bit to hook up my static line. And he has to duck under it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so where was your first assignment afterwards? So first assignment, I went to uh, JBLM, uh, and I was out at 2nd ID. I was in 2nd uh, Brigade, uh, Striker Brigade uh, combat team, and I was in 2-1 uh, infantry. 
and again, an, another small world. And we talk about mentors. Uh, the the main reason I put JBLM as my first choice because uh, for kids who don't know any better, just uh, the the junior officers going through iBullock, they they go for the uh, the brand names that they they see in some of the movies. They'll put down, hey, eighty second, hey, one hundred first, yeah, yeah. Marshall, why'd you put JBLM number one? And a lot of it that was General Brown. That was his duty station where he made the most impacts uh, and. He was able to get me underneath a brigade commander, uh, Colonel Chung, who was his platoon leader um, at, at one point in his career. And uh, best uh, best advice I was ever given was to go to JBLM because I had a great support group. I ended up having uh, two company commanders who were former regiment guys. I had a first sergeant who was a regiment guy. My battalion commander was a regiment guy. My brigade commander was a regiment guy. And they really uh, started getting me excited about the Ranger Regiment. And up in that point, I didn't really have an appreciation or under, because, you know, the Ranger Regiments are such quiet professionals uh, that it wasn't until I got to hang around Rangers that I really uh, found out that it was something that I wanted to do. So I went to JBLM, and I'm really lucky that I did uh, because of Colonel uh, Chung and because of the Rangers I got to hang around with. How long was it before you got a chance to put in your packet? So timelines are always different, uh, and my timeline was a little screwed. I had to put in my packet really soon. It was almost, uh, I think it was like two or three months after I got to my uh, first duty station. And it was just because of how it worked out with my eye bullet class was one of the later eye bullet classes in the year. And that was because I left the Milwaukee Bucks when I did, and so on mm. and so forth. So uh, that's, that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, people ask me, you know, junior officers, uh, hey, when should I put my packet in? And I'll just tell them, don't, don't do what I did. Uh, you know, go explore. I would love for you to have a lot of time at your first duty station because that's where you learn a lot and you show up more prepared to help the Ranger Regiment. Uh, and I, I had a great experience at my first duty station, but between COVID shutting everything down for a while and we were working very dispersed and isolated, uh, in my accelerated timeline, it was it was a pretty quick transition uh, to having to put in that packet for Ranger Regiment. Yeah, so how was that transition then into the regiment? Uh, it was great. Again, humbling. But at, at this point, uh, I think we all agree on this. Like, those humbling environments are the ones you want to be in. You know, the rooms where you're not the smartest person in the room, you should fight to get in that room. Because yeah. those are the, the teams that are going to humble you. They're going to challenge you to bring your best. And it was also humbling with my peers uh, in the sense that, Hey, uh, what, what what did you do before you got here? Oh, well, I was a platoon leader for a year. I was an XO for a year, and I did a scout PL time for this amount of time. And for me, mine was much more accelerated. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I feel like I had people in the Ranger Regiment that had assessed me through RAS2, and they were getting to know me, and they weren't going to set me up for failure. They put me in positions to where I could use my strengths, and I could still get caught up and learn they really develop you. Uh, th there is expectation that you show up with the right attitude and you have the physical fitness. Uh, but I was kind of taken back with how much time goes into these LPDs and they're, them trying to bring uh, junior leaders along. Uh, so I, I was anxious, to your point. I had reservations. Hey, am I going to show up ready to contribute? And, and in some ways, I wasn't uh, ready to contribute at the level I'm contributing now, but they, they got me to where I am now. So. Yeah, that's, that's a great compliment, once again, but from an officer's perspective of just how the regiment takes their leaders and really utilizes them in the best way. And I'm not trying to do a plug necessarily yeah. just for regiment, but you guys do a great job of once you get the people who are qualified in there, how to, how to you know, lean on their strengths. You know, uh but they, the regiment does do a, a much better job now of getting the right people in the jobs. And we do, um, we do a lot of uh, uh, talent working groups and stuff and, and senior meetings to, to decide, make those decisions. So uh, it's, it's a lot, a lot more goes into it. Uh, who's going in those positions and who's going to be with this different person uh, as a Ranger buddy, you know, PO platoon sergeant, first sergeant commander. It's like an uh, NBA draft. You're kind of looking at the really board is. and uh, trying to decide. Well, uh, yeah. Like we, you know, at my, at my level of sergeant major, like we had, we got to decide, like these are the guys that are coming up and going to be able to take these platoons. You know, who would he, who would he want to take? And, you know, we, we literally sat down there for a couple of hours and we do, we hash it out and we're like, you know, sergeant major has to send out that, hey, buddy, you didn't make the cut type stuff. Yeah. Um, since Marshall got here, I, you know, uh, obviously everybody saw him, <laughs> but uh, the, he he's literally stepped up since day one. You know, he's like, I wonder if I'm going to be the you know guy. But I remember like the first time, like he's literally walking at, 
out. And I think I was telling you this one, Dave, like he literally never done this before in his life and briefed in front of all these people that have all these different amazing talents to do with on, on VTCs with, um, you know, the other amount of people that have way better talents than I'll ever even think of. But with the most up, utmost confidence and in, in walked out on the floor and, you know, he's pointing at, Shit that he probably literally just learned what it was. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, the, to the point where he's probably in the bathroom going, okay, and this is that. And, you know, like, it, and it literally sounded like he'd been sitting there doing it for the last 15 years. Like, I was like, what the hell? <laughs> well, you have that way of caring about yourself. And again, uh, the way you carry yourself um, probably is because of where, how you came through everything and who touched your lives along the way. But, um, you also have that voice and the way you carry yourself. I could totally hear yourself in an NBA game doing a sports cast um, as well type of thing. And, <laughs> Great stereo. Man. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But, I mean, you just have that confidence about you. And, well, it's um, a humble confidence. It too, is. Right? So it's a, we, yeah. With somebody come call, come off really confident, like they can almost come off like cocky. You know? <laughs> yeah. But you, have, you, don't, you don't have any of that. Like you go with a smile. And and I've, I mean, I've interrupted you talking. And I've come and talked to you. And. And I'd be like, hey, buddy, like, and you're just like, oh, yeah, Roger, Roger. like, very humble, take whatever you got to give him and, like, put it in his playbook, if you will, and, and execute, you know, with, with the utmost humility. And it makes you want to be better. You're like, I, I might have been pissed off about that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> He's well, amazing. Was it challenging for you because you didn't get that time within conventional uh, enough time that some typically do? Or did you feel like you got enough time in the conventional to get you prepared? Uh, I, I feel like I did get enough time. Yeah. And my, my leaders uh, at, you know, between Colonel Chung and the leaders I had at, out at uh, JBLM, they, they prepared me in, in so many ways. But no matter, I could have been there for 10 years preparing and I still would have gotten to regiment i feel like i wasn't prepared enough uh, yeah. so i just i don't know if i was ever going to be able to beat that feeling of you want to give them the, them your best but you always feel like you can get better uh so no I, i'm really grateful with everything especially covid we we did some really creative things to navigate training during that time in a safe way and i got to be a part of some cool opportunities out there i uh, loved my second id experience it, it did prepare me very well but it's probably a personal thing at the end of it i'm like man i I just I want to give Ranger Regiment the world. I wish I was coming to them a, a 30 year military veteran with a lot more experience, but they got what they got and uh, th- they've been able to make do with it. And so I, I'm grateful that uh, they put up with me. Yeah. So General Brown, where is he like fitting in with all of this uh, through this this stage? Yeah, well, just uh, instrumental and helpful uh, throughout. Uh, by the time I got to Regiment, I think at that point he was retiring. OK, but. Uh, I don't know if it's serendipity or, or what, but at that point, I also start crossing paths with more and more people who General Brown has his fingerprints all over, people that he's mentored. I know we'd mentioned Colonel Shaw with RSTB, um, <clears throat> and it, it's just uh, he, he's the kind of leader and the kind of character where, and he keeps the kind of company where the, there isn't a more powerful icebreaker in certain rooms than saying like, oh, hey, I'm, you know, I'm friends with General Brown. That's, that's all we need to know about you. Uh, we know the kind of friends that he keeps. Uh, so that it's, it's a powerful thing. So I, I haven't gotten to see him as much in person. He's still doing great things now. Re- retired outside the military, he's doing well. Um, but his, uh, he planted a bunch of trees he'll never get to see grow. You know, there, there are all these leaders going on to do great things that kind of bear his name in some way. Yeah, so what would you say would be some of the things if you're – you know, if you're looking back and you're trying to give some advice to some of those guys that are coming up, what are what are the some of the things that you've learned along the way? And obviously, you've had some great coaches and mentors that you've already passed on some great nuggets within the show. But if you wanted to pull somebody up, what what kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, your your timing's good because they uh, my my mortar platoon. We were running a mortar range for i bullock uh students so i was in their shoes just a couple years ago yeah and s- same question what do you wish you, you knew and uh, uh something i i told them was uh i think that's come through this i said hey i i wish as much as i did i wish i would have taken another spoonful of humble pie you know from the very beginning because as soon as you come in here thinking that you know everything um uh, that that's that much less that you get the chance to learn also, you're in a very unique environment in iBulk. You've got cadre. Their only job and their, their metric is making you better. 
uh, you're not going to be in a whole lot of environments like that in your life. You're going to be in environments where the guy on your left wants the job more than you and almost hopes that you do poorly. Uh, this is a special time where, so th this is like a melting pot of talent and mentoring and, and just uh, take it all in. Uh, and you got to do that with a humble approach. Uh, two, I told the young officers, and I'll say it here on the podcast in case there are any young officers listening, uh, I wish I had more of an appreciation for mortars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Paul would love you right now. If Paul yeah, were here co-hosting. Right <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, mortars are, to me, uh, the way I describe them and the reason I really like them is I was kind of a, a dirty work basketball player. I didn't care as much about the kind of points that I got, but some of the things that don't show up in the stat book, uh, setting screens, uh, setting someone else up for success, and mortars do that in a really powerful way. They're almost like the uh, the Dennis Rodman of uh, of the military. You know, you don't win without them. Yes, them. <laughs> yes. I'm so glad you used Dennis Rodman <laughs> as that description. Yeah, Paul, that was for you. Oh. Paul, that's that's definitely for you. Yeah. Yeah. Also, they they can sometimes be just as crazy as Dennis Rodman. That's right. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, why yeah. I, if you ever see Paul, you know. That's why I was so happy you said Dennis Rodman. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it was speaking to an audience of officers. I had to let them know that uh you know hey take another scoop of humble pie uh love love your mortars and uh yeah th those are the the big things i tried to leave them with yeah what about uh anything as far as like your ncos or uh didn't yeah so with that i i do like the analogy of uh with basketball right like uh the nba 450 players and uh, misconceptions people think hey these are the 450 best players in the world I'll tell you, if you go on, go and get the 451st person who didn't quite make it in the NBA, he's really good. <laughs> he's really good. He, he belongs in there every bit as much, but a lot of it's timing, a lot of it's opportunity. So really, if I had to break it down, and this isn't official, don't quote me, but the way I interpret it is the top 100 yeah. players, they are the top 100, and they, are, they have next-level talent and ability. But the bottom 350, they're interchangeable with the, the next 1,000 probably in the world. And it's a lot of its timing, a lot of its opportunity. Uh, and it's who are the top 100 going to want to play with? Who are they going to want to compete with every day? Who's going to fit in? Who's going to be able to take a back seat and realize, hey, you know what? Steph Curry's a better sh three-point shooter than me. How else can I add value? Anyways, the, the, the reason I say all that is as we look at NCOs, I'm coming to the Ranger Regiment. Uh, these guys are, have a storied tradition of success. They're long tenured. They've done more than I could ever hope to do up into this point. And I get to ask, answer the tough question, how am I going to add value to what they're already doing? Also, in the same vein, you know, the Ranger Regiment, they have high standards. And, uh, you know, they expect a lot out of their officers. They expect a lot in terms of uh, especially your attitude. Uh, so they, they don't have to compete with you. Uh, you know, there is someone else who, who would give his left arm for your opportunity. Uh, so, again, it's like those top 100. Who do we want to compete with? Do we want to compete? Do we want to be in the trenches with this officer? Uh, and then uh, additionally with the NCOs, uh, I was worried about bringing enough to the table. And now that I've been here, I realize they'll teach me everything I need to know. Uh, well, what I need to bring is, is an attitude, learner's mindset. Uh, and then maybe some energy and enthusiasm uh, just to make the days go better. Uh, but in terms of the tactical knowledge and everything, you know, I, I know, Jason, you mentioned the, the brief we did uh, for one of our exercise. And I was saying terms that my NCOs had just fed me the moment before. I, I didn't even fully appreciate what they meant, but they set me up for success. Uh, so th that's been my experience with the NCOs and the Ranger Regiment. Yeah. So what rank are you now? I'm captain. Dude, I mean... The, the amount of it, uh, knowledge, again, amazing. I, I'd follow you. Oh, no. You know, I mean, like, you're. <laughs> they you, follow me and an NCO. <laughs> you, you've got great <laughs> leadership. <laughs> Though, seriously, yeah. you know, give yourself some credit yeah, here. You, you, you're an amazing leader. Yeah. You've got great leadership. You've got, uh, I, I love your stories. Mm -hmm. I could probably sit here another three hours <laughs> and listen to them. <laughs> Um, this, the nuggets of information that you're drop, uh, dropping and the, it, whether it's the story of how it occurred to you or, um, you know, how you've seen it play out or, or whatever the case may be, you know, 
sharing those is just amazing. I don't know if you've ever planned on writing. I know everybody, a lot of people come on here and talk about writing a book, but if you ever think about doing that and you do it around the way like Coach K did and, you know, and around leadership and how you applied the game or your life's left lessons into that, I'd buy that book in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. totally. I mean, you put that in print, dude, there's just so much good that can come out of that. Um, and so I hope if nothing else, you do consider doing that. If you haven't done it, uh, I've already started thinking about it because, uh, y- there's only so much that you can impart in a, in a, um, a, you know, a small amount of time with you, when you're with your NCOs or when you're with your junior officers and stuff, and you're trying to give them that, that coaching and that mentoring. Um, uh, but it's those types of, um, platforms or whatever or mm-hmm. platforms like this where you can reach a broader audience and you can actually make a maybe a more impactful um you know um send those impactful messages and, and put those fingerprints and stuff like that um take every opportunity you can because you've got a lot to share yeah don't trying to and again i i gotta talk it up to surrounding yourself with good people yeah and i i, I want to mention this you uh, Jason, do you know uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Reynolds? Uh, he's one of our mortarmen. He, he's been a long tenured regiment guy, and he gave me he told me something that I, uh, during one of our counselings, and he said uh, he said, "Sir," and he put down his dip bottle. And he's, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's when you know he's serious. <laughs> yeah, he, he's <laughs> tree yeah. ranger stuff. He said, uh, "That's so, awesome." <laughs> he's like, uh, "Sir, I'm like a I'm like a." Have you ever seen a turtle on a fence post? I said, "No, I've never seen a turtle on a fence post." He said, "Well, if you did, you'd probably think that, that turtle didn't get there by himself. Someone had to put him up there." And I'm like, "Oh my God, that, that's that's me. I'm a turtle on a fence post." <laughs> so that that's what he said about himself. That's what I I, I like to steal that from. But I got to give him credit. Yeah. Uh, to say about myself, I do feel like a turtle on a fence post at times. Mm-hmm. You know here at the Ranger Regiment, et cetera. I didn't get here by myself. Someone had to put me up there. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm proud to be here, and I'm trying to uh, capitalize it while on it while I got the mic here with you or, or while anyone will hear me, and, you know, maybe maybe I will think about uh, a book. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that would be amazing. And uh, now that you've mentioned his name, you can now patent it and use it however you want because you own it at this point. <laughs> Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Marshall, and sharing your journey so far. And we hope to follow your career in the future as things progress and um, wish you nothing but the best and success. And I, I do hope that you do consider something like that. And um, again, we'd love to have you come back on the show. I, I'm sure I'd like to spend another hour or two with you and at least talking about some other you know, leadership nuggets. It seems like you've uh, not only lived the experience, but you have a lot to, to be able to share from just, um, again, the things you've learned. So yeah. no, I really appreciate. It. I'm honored to be on here, and I, I'd be happy to come back. This is fun hanging out with good people like you guys. This is a lot of fun. Well, I, uh, it's been a you know honor uh, in the time you've worked. I've worked around you in my career. You know, it's, been, it's definitely been like a, a highlight of my career to, to to be able to say that I've worked with somebody at your level and um, that <clears throat> that matures you. You know, coming in with the attitude and mindset of you have, and uh, I was super humbled that you. Um, when I asked you to come and do the podcast that you're like, yeah, I'll do that for you for a I was like, that's awesome. It speaks uh, to your character. And I just can't thank you enough, man. It's been, been a great time. Been a great ride with you. Absolutely.